Okay, last class, we um, I just, uh, it was just some discussion that before we even started the class about Purim Suda, so then uh, it was in the chat. So we started speaking about it again, and uh, I mentioned that I asked the Posek and uh, Rav Abadi, and he wasn't sure whether you had to have bread. I, I've now learned that he wasn't sure, not because he didn't know, I, there's a, different views on each side. So I guess he didn't know what side the Puskin. So I thank Eli, Rabbi Mordechai, a bunch of you sent me that it's a big machokes, uh, the, the Mug and Avraham and the Chidah say you don't have to have it. Others say you do have to. The Chavitz Chaim, Mishnah Burr doesn't say one way or the other. Um, I wonder, by the way, if the people who say that you do need bread, uh, because that's what a Suda is, if they would say it if they were alive today, for the simple reason that uh, bread used to be part of a meal. Uh, sometimes when I go to Haredim to eat, they always, like, even though during the week, they'll say, here, let us wash. And it's so strange, because in, in my world, uh, other than Shabbos and Yom Tov, you don't wash. Uh, Thanksgiving, we sit down for a big formal dinner. It always feels weird, because you expect that there'd be washing and uh, Kiddush, and there isn't. Uh, but we don't. We go out, for, we go out to restaurants. Uh, we don't wash. We go, I was just at a wedding, not yesterday, a week ago, uh, at the Marina del Rey, some of you probably know it in the Bronx, 600 people, not a mask in sight. So you know that in America, we're, we've, we're in a different stage. But so no one washes. So in a e time where bread is not considered essential, and we have other carbohydrates, uh, it's hard to see, since there's no Lecha Mishnah, why it's essential. But you know, whatever you do, I, I don't think it's such a big deal. You wash, you don't wash. Uh, it's really not uh, a major thing. You have authorities on either side. But since we're getting close to forum, I'll say it again what I said last year, because we have all these new people listening to us. So um, here's something that does matter. And I guarantee you, almost guarantee, uh, well, I can say that uh, odds are that if you go to an Ashkenazic show, uh, they'll do it wrong. So those who were with me last year remember this, but we have lots and lots of new people, at least double the amount of people listening. So uh, I will uh, say it again. Uh, let me pull it up here. Uh, here you go. You'll listen in reading the Megillah. Pay attention. Um, when they get to, to uh, the, um, the sixth Pasuk, you'll hear it. The, the Baal Kori in an Ashkenazic. Shosfardim always get it right. He'll read. I'll, and mark my word, almost guaranteed, he'll say, I'll ritzpat, bahat fashesh. And that changes the meaning of the word. It's ritzpa in biblical Hebrew means hot coals. You have the verse in Yeshayahu. The word is ritzfat, and actually it's supposed to be a shvana, as you see indicated. Ritzefat. Now, if he, if he makes the mistake, as they routinely do, uh, the post game that I've seen say you don't need to repeat it uh, because today we assume Ritzpa also means floor, but uh, it's a mistake. And really, it should be corrected beforehand, to tell the person, because it's almost impossible. I don't see how you can correct someone, Miguel Sester. Uh, it's, I've never seen it done because uh, they all know it, then it'll be too embarrassing. So, uh, my suggestion is you speak to the Balkore ahead of time or you tell the rabbi. The rabbi knows. <laughs> the rabbi Michael actually knows. Uh, not because I told him. He had already spoken to the Balei Kriya about this. So there you go. So we, but we have a few weeks still to, uh, to worry about that. Uh, okay. Another thing. Sometimes when I'm speaking here, I get the comments, the private chats. And, uh, you know, it's hard for me sometimes, I'll regal achas to respond, so sometimes I concede, and then as soon as class is over, I realize I shouldn't have conceded, and uh, last week was one of them. And uh, I, uh, I, I, was, I said nivel pair, and uh, we'll see why I said that later, we'll get back to that issue. And I said, but technically it should be nivel pair. So someone um, texted me that uh, it's with a vav, not a bet. So, uh, you know, I didn't have time to think on my toes, so I said, okay, uh, I'll accept it, but I shouldn't have conceded, because no, it actually is with Hello. a bet. Not, not only is it with a bet, uh, it, uh, hold on a second, let me show you here. It, uh, it's even in the Gemara, the, the wording. Uh, here you see in Shabbos uh, 33a, it, they don't use the word term nibul, but they say navutpe, but you can see it's uh, it's the bet. And you can look at any dictionary. It's Hello. it's a bet. It, the, it, the word's Hello. a bet. And uh, 
Aregalachas, I couldn't uh, remember, so I conceded. Uh, now, it is true that if you look at some more recent sources, I've seen that they do, I, I Googled it, so on Otsar Chachmas, I, I Googled it in Otsar Chachma, out of thousands and thousands of sources, you get in the tens with a vav, because uh, it's a mistake, though, because people say nivul, nivul, as opposed to nivul, and that's, maybe that's from Yiddish, or just a mistake. Uh, you know, it's funny, the word nivul with a vav and uh, nivul, I really mean the same thing, but, so it's become accepted to pronounce it incorrectly, and therefore people uh, are starting to write it incorrectly. But 100% it's with a bet. However, I did say that I'll give you some other examples of where because of the mispronunciation, mispronunciation, it's uh, created problems. So uh, let me uh, give you uh, just a couple of examples of this, um, of what I meant by that. Let's get back here to the screen. Um, ah, here's a, one of the most famous ones about the bracha we make at a wedding. So what does the Shulchan Aruch say? Uh, you say, Asher Kishon V'son of Aharayos, of Sephardic, Aharayot, V'asar Lanu Arusot, V'itir Lanu Hanesuot, Al Yedei Chupa, the Kiddushin, with a bet, without a dagesh, because it's after Chupa, Baruch Hashem M'Kadosh Yisrael. Now, the Ramah says that the bracha should be Chupa, and then with a vav, vakidushin, with a vav. Uh, now, which one is it? Plenty of Rishonim say it's with a bet, and that the, it's a mistake that uh, it's with a vav, but it's the people, uh, they heard it so often, hupa vakidushin, with a vet, that they assume it's with a vav. The Ritva says, and others say, no, it is with a vav. So that's the distinction, Ashkenazi, Misfaradim, and I'm not sure if it's a mistake. The Ritva says it's not a mistake, but many say it is a mistake. I, I also mentioned Rav David Cohen in his book, of Kovu uh, uh he says, Hakuvu uh, Mishar, he says, he gives a page, uh, 11, he gives a number of examples of this where you see that there's a mistake. The copyist was listening to someone read it, and then he um, misheard what was said, or he heard correctly, but it was the wrong letter. And he gives examples where, for example, you have in Rashi, quotes in Zvachim, the word Pesach appears, Pesamechet, and it should be Pesach with a, a sof. But he, 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 the person copying it was heard it, and he wrote it down. He gives another good example. This is great uh, in Rashi and Sanhedrin, where Rashi says, Ezo tova, but it shouldn't be tova with a tet. It should be with a tough teva. So what is that? That's the Lithuanian pronunciation. Uh, tova is teva. And uh, so that's, uh, he gives uh, good examples of that. This idea of Pesach, it has been suggested, I don't know if this is correct, that the name Pesach, People are named Pesach. Isn't that a strange name? You're not going to name someone Sukkot. You're not going to name someone Shavuos. Someone's named Pesach. Why is he named Pesach? And we have this name already, even uh, going back to medieval times. Why did you name Pesach? Uh, so they say, if you look online, I looked earlier today, he said, when someone's born on Pesach, they gave him the name. I, I don't know. Well, what? So if you're born on Sukkot, you're named Sukkot? So whoever, this is like an ex post facto justification. Now, I don't know if I'm going to tell you is correct, but this has been suggested in traditional sources that the name is really Pesachia. Pesach, and that's a Tanakh name, Yudhet Yudhe, and the uh, Yudhe dropped off, and it was Pesach, and then it became Pesach with a Sin, uh, no, with a Samech, as opposed to a Saf. So again, I don't know if that's where it came from, comes from, but uh, it does make a little bit of sense that it would be Pesachia, and you don't want to say God's name at the end, so then it became Pesach, and then uh, and that just became by listening it. Uh, we know that, for example, you look at the word Soto, we spell it with a uh, Samech, and yet plenty of people spell it with a Sin. It became, uh, you know, they became interchangeable. So maybe, and I, I hope I'm not offending anyone with the name Pesach, it's a very good name, Ritzi Pesach Frank, uh, uh, in Camp Morasha in the 70s, a very popular teacher, uh, Rabbi Pesach Oratz. If anyone went to Stern, you probably remember Rabbi Oratz, and uh, he taught at Morasha. He actually recommended to my parents that for high school I go to the Mir Yeshiva, and uh, that because I was actually a learner in in, in camp. <laughs> 
But uh, so it, it's a it's a good name Pesach, but uh, is it an authentic name or has it uh, become? Uh, it's like my name Melech, which uh, a lot of people think it's Eli Melech. It's not. Where'd you get the name Eli Melech from, though? That's uh, until Eli Melech of Lezhensk, No one was named Eli Melech. We have no record of anyone being named Eli Melech. So. Uh, that's actually not my name, but people think it is. So names could come about for interesting uh, reasons. Um, um, okay, I want to, <laughs> I do have some other things, but uh, I will get to that. Uh, if one week I get to questions stop uh, coming in as much as they are, I'll get to the things uh, I still want to get to about Vaivain Chavez. Uh, wait to hear what the, from the Gra, the Vilna Gon and Rukhayim. But I want to return because we have a lot to do to Rabbi Shaul Berlin. Oh, you know, in Myra's book, uh, I, I, I looked at it again on page 11. He says what I told you. Uh, um, he says that uh, the community, the dispute between Emden and Ibschitz, uh with the writs of excommunication, so divided the community that it was less able to oppose new ideas in its midst, et cetera. So you see already the, um, the Emden Aishas dispute, the breakdown of rabbinic authority is leading the way to reform is mentioned by Meyer, but it's mentioned by earlier sources by, uh, as well. As I said, I think it's Shola. Um, if you recall, we ended last, when well, we were dealing with the, uh, the Summing Rosh, and I, I, I I mentioned uh, how in his, the first shuva we looked at, where he's talking about the person who occasionally says heresy, that that's, that's okay. Uh, it's not so bad, I should say. You don't have to worry about the Megillah, but the one who does it continuously, and the words he uses, ve'eno maksha atzmo, but just consistently uh, uh, say this stuff. And I said that I couldn't help but thinking that this is an illusion to a sexual matter. And I said that I looked and I never found a usage of it in the Rishonim like this. Well, I looked again after class on Otsar Chachma and um, I did not find any Rishonim that used the word in that way. What I did find, well, I knew this already, and I'm not 100% sure I'm correct in attributing to Shaul Berlin this underhanded thing, but there is another expression that, um, it's in Moed Katan 16b. It's, it's a drosh. They're referring to King David. And they say about him that uh, when he learned Torah, they derive it from the word adino, that he would, uh, I'll just read it in English, he would make himself soft as a worm. When you go to war, he would make himself hard and strong as a tree. Uh, I'm assuming that also is not an illusion because I don't think the rabbis were doing that. But uh, you do have this usage. But among the Rishonim, I didn't find it. And uh, so I'm not 100% sure. Nachum Shmaryahu emails me. He's not sure either whether it's the same insinuation. But he does point to Rav Yaakov Emden, believe it or not. Rav Yaakov Emden in Shilas Yavetz, volume one, number 171, in speaking about... Um, uh, a, a Mila issue, he actually uses the language as well. He says that uh, he's talking about someone who opposes um, uh, the, the opinion, doesn't listen, uh, he's, he's stubborn. He says, Umaksha atzmo adata So it does seem to be here that he's also that clearly Ravakov Emden is playing around with the expression. Uh, uh, and we know Yaakov Emden had some strange uh, ways about these matters, but I, I don't know if I'm wrong in accusing Shaul Berlin of underhandedly putting in a risque reference, then I apologize to him, believe, but uh, he's already in uh, God's uh, bad graces for all the other things he did that uh, we don't need to worry about uh, that one. I want to look the, the one final tshuva of uh, Shaul Berlin to show you uh, his subversive nature, his uh, under attempts, tries to undermine traditional Judaism. And that's number 301. If you look in the Bissamin Rosh, number 301, it's not by the Rosh. This is by an individual named Yaakov Ben Machir. So who, who is Yaakov Ben Machir? Well, the, the Casa de Harsana, that, 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 by the way, that's the name of the commentary, Shabu, and it means like a fried fish or something. Uh, um, but the Casa de Harsana tells you, uh, he says, uh, 
I don't recall such a person ever being mentioned except for one place in the response of the Rashba. So that's what Shaul Berlin did when he, uh, he, he comes up with these names, like the person who supposedly put it together, Yitzhak de Molina. He's mentioned one time in the response of the Beit Yosef. So you have the Arisha, Yaakov de Machir, who's, who's, we don't know anything about. He's, he's mentioned one time, but the Shaul Berlin pulls out a name like this and throws it in uh, uh, to the response. So let, let me summarize what this uh, response is about. Uh, and I'll use Jacobs. He gives a very good uh, summary. He was asked, he deals with, uh, we know that for three matters, the three big ones, one gives, one martyrs oneself, uh, or luckily one's supposed to martyr oneself, then uh, uh, violate the sin, murder, certain sexual immoralities, and uh, idolatry. If someone says worship that idol. Um, and Jews uh, in medieval times allowed themselves to be martyred in um, we come to Spain this summer and Portugal. We'll talk about this big problem. Why is it that in France and why is it that in England and in Germany, Jews allow themselves to be martyred by the thousands. And yet when you go to Spain and also Portugal, yes, there were Jews who allowed themselves, who, well, they didn't really have to deal with so much. They, well, 1391, there really was some martyrdom and, they, and many of them left when they were expelled, but thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and more converted in a way you don't see in uh, the Ashkenazic lands. So uh, we will get involved in that. But uh, in this tshuva, the sage, sage in quotes, raises doubts as to whether there's a concept of uh, martyrdom. Why? And remember, these are the most fundamental, eternally binding halachot of uh, martyrdom, of not uh, acknowledging idolatry. What Yaakov ben Machir, in quote, states is that there is no longer an obligation for martyrdom when it comes to idolatry or adultery. With murder, there is, because you can't kill someone else to save your own life. So you're, but if it's just a, a, an idolatry, what Jews killed them, well, allowed themselves to be killed for, killed their children for reason. Um, so as not to be forced to convert, Yaakov ben Machir says, we no longer have a Sanhedrin today. Since we don't have a Sanhedrin, the, we don't have issue. We can't decide questions of uh, dine nefashos. That's what it's called. Matters of life and death. We don't have a Sanhedrin, so we can't execute people. So Yaakov ben Machir says that uh, the ruling that you have to martyr yourself, that's the ruling of uh, like the equivalent of the ruling of a Sanhedrin. And we don't have a Sanhedrin today, so therefore there can't be any dine nefashos. It's a life and death ruling that only a Sanhedrin can rule. And therefore, since we don't have a Sanhedrin, you don't martyr yourself. And then he says, in addition to that, there's so many sveikot. Every, every Torah matter you come to, there's machokas. So there's always going to be disputes. And since there are so many sveikot, sveikos, and so many, and so much disputes, uh, there's always going to be a doubt about something. So you never have to martyr yourself because you can always find some suffix. So he gives two reasons why there should never be a reason to martyr yourself. Now, from a from an enlightened 18th century perspective, this all makes perfect sense because human life is the most important thing. The idea that you would ever, that you would uh, give up your life for a religion, that's, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Sort of like today, no one would say that makes sense. Uh, and to say that uh, uh, it's, uh, this is Dine Nefashos, and since we don't have a Sanhedrin, there's no idea of martyrdom. Who ever heard of such a thing? It's the Mincha Salazar, Rav Chaim Alazar Shapiro, the Munkacher, no relation to me. Uh, you know, he's such an, he's such an extremist. I don't know if I take it as a, uh, a sign of pride. If I was related to him, it's like being related to the Satna Rebbe. I think I would, but I mean, some of his ideas, the Minchas Salazar's ideas are so wacko and so outlandish. He even hated Aguda Cicero. He, he said about the, uh, he said about Daf Yomi. He said, what a joke Daf Yomi is. They, they stop in the middle of a sugya and they say, oh, it's a Daf, we're ended. He said, the whole idea of Daf Yomi is only to bring, it's all political. It's to bring people into Aguda Cicero's tents. Uh, and he said, and yet, he was the closest of friends to Rabbi Chayak of Weinberg, who they were so foreign from one another. Uh, once uh, uh, Rabbi Weinberg said that he knows the, uh, the Munkacha Rebbe doesn't have Ruch HaKodesh, because the Munkacha Rebbe was telling all of his chassid, when Rabbi Weinberg comes to Berlin, the video is online. The video of the great Munkach wedding is online. 
in which you see, by the way, that Munkat was not all Hasidic. You see the videos there of all the, the kids singing Hatikva with a different, different words, by the way. They had everything. They had Mizrahi. They had irreligious in Munkach, but uh, And you see the, 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 the wedding scene also. And Rabbi Weinberg, you see him in the picture for a quarter of a second. So when uh, everyone wanted to know why... Um, the Hasidim and the Munkatcher, why the Munkatcher was uh, giving such a kavod. He put him under the chuppah, standing there, this rabbiner doctor, and uh, and uh, he gave him such kavod. Uh, the Munkatcher said to them that uh, Rabbi Weinberg only studies secular subjects in the bathroom. So Rabbi Weinberg said, from this I know that the Rebbe is, doesn't have Ruch HaGodesh, because, uh, because he said that, because he could say about me that I only study secular subjects in the uh, in those days, they call it Beta Kisei, I guess. Uh, but uh, so the Munkacher, he's such a fascinating figure. We should do classes on him. Um, he attacks this chuva and he points out so correctly that the lack of a Sanhedrin only means that we don't have court cases where the Sanhedrin rules that someone is deserving of the death penalty. But where and when you have to suffer martyrdom has nothing to do with the Sanhedrin. It's not, it's not a question of DNA and a shows. It's simply a religious question. It's no different than uh, Yom Kippur. Do you have to eat or not on Yom Kippur? I mean, it's a totally religious question. And the fact that the Besamim Rosh was trying to put this in to undermine again, the whole idea of martyrdom. Now, Besamim Rosh has to deal with a big problem and he takes it up. Well, you look in medieval times, we see that all the Jews did allow themselves to be killed, did suffer martyrdom. So what's that about? So Basamim Roche says, well, there was no legal obligation for them to do that, but they did it anyway. Why did they do it anyway? Because they saw their lives as having no significance among the Gentiles. That is, halachically, they were allowed to convert to Christianity. But how can a Yid live among the Goyim? You know, that's... Uh, so they allow themselves to be killed because for a Jew to live among the Goyim, that's pasnish, it doesn't, it's not a good life. Uh, and the Minchas Elazar says that on the surface, you might think this is a good thing, because after all, these people are not obligated to give up their lives, but they give up their lives anyway, so as not to live among the Christians. But the Minchas Elazar says that no, this is actually the most dangerous at all, because what he's saying is that there's no halacha, there's no mitzvah for martyrdom. And when they martyred themselves in medieval times, why did they do it? just to preserve their separateness, their ethnic uniqueness. Um, they, they substituted religious reason for martyrdom with a national reason, with a social reason. And the Menachem Salazar says, just as the Tzioinim do in our day. <laughs> What's the most important thing? Uh, the fact that we're a nation. So since the Jews couldn't feel comfortable living among the Christians, they accepted martyrdom uh, because so that's an ethnic reason. And that's the Menachem Salazar says, that's what the Zionists do. No longer is religion the reason for our life, rather, that why, why we exist as a people. Not the Torah, like Rasad Yagon said, that there are the Jewish people are people because of the Torah. No, it's all about um, our, ethno, our ethnic identification. And uh, the Menachem Salazar is, of course, correct. He rarely is incorrect. He's incorrect when he says about the Rambam some stuff, that the Rambam's uh, rationalist things were only said to uh, find find favor with the uh, Haskalah-oriented types, but he didn't really believe this stuff. But uh, generally, the Mincha Salazar had such a strong intellect and uh, such a critical sense, and uh, he saw clearly right through this Basami Rosh. We could spend more time on the Basami Rosh. There's a number of other chulot, but I think you get the point that this is a proto reform, or maybe proto, or maybe just a, a, in addition to reform, a nihilistic attempt to tear down uh, a traditional Judaism from the inside through the ruse of a attributing it to a um, uh, an early sage. Every time we have these uh, forgeries, we have to ask ourselves why it's done. So we have forgeries, anti-Zionist forgeries. You have all sorts of forgeries. And usually there's a reason. Usually it's not just someone having fun at everyone else's expense. I have to tell you, by the way, and I'm going to write about this in my next post. Uh, an earthquake landed uh, in the last few weeks on um, academic Jewish scholarship and also on traditional Jewish scholarship in that uh, a book appeared by a uh, a Haredi guy, but a, a really a guy who knows scholarship. He's the son of Rav Yaakov Moshe Hillel, the um, 
Baghdad, not the, well, he's Baghdadi, but he's from India. He's, he, he, he's a big Makubo. You can see him on uh, YouTube also in English. He comes from England and he went, if I'm from India, went to England, started at Gateshead. But he's one of the top uh, Kabbalists uh, in Jerusalem. And also he's a, he's a posek and uh, he's written many things. He even has a book called Tamim Tia, a very nice book I have, which is against all this practical Kabbalah. But his son is a real, he's like one of these, who well, he is, one of these Haredi academic scholars. He came out with a book in which he claims and provides lots of proof that Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Toledano, Yaakov Moshe Toledano was chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. Before that, he was in Alexandria, Egypt. He then was minister of religion. He's, he's a postsake, but he's also a scholar, published lots of stuff. I wanted to do classes on him. He claims that loads and loads of texts that Yaakov Moshe Toledano said he had, because he was a collector. Uh, he, JTS has many of his stuff collected many of his archives, as I recall, manuscripts, that a lot of these manuscripts are forgeries. Now, so much of, uh, of modern scholarship on the Middle East, uh, from medieval, the medieval Middle East is based on, um, or a lot of it, I should say, is based on stuff that uh, Toledano published. He even published stuff related to the family of the Rambam, uh, that if this is true, that uh, he was a forger. And now you're talking about a posek here. You're talking about a rav of communities, a well-respected rav. Yosef gives him such kavod. Uh, he, he was a very popular Sephardic rabbi. He lost out to Rav Nisim to be chief rabbi of the state of Israel. Uh, if he was a forger, that I can't explain. I mean, this is, uh, I, I, I haven't made a judgment on it yet because I haven't studied it carefully, but we spoke a couple of semesters ago about Svihirsch Auerbach and there's other examples, but um, I mean, this would, uh, this is going to, as I said, it's an earthquake. Uh, uh, so well, what else can I tell you about the Shaw Berlin? Well, um, he dies in London. I, um, you have an article here by Rabbi um, Raymond Apple. Englishman who ended up for many years in Australia. He has an article here about the heretical rabbi, Saul Berlin, and he points out something very interesting. Well, first, as I said, uh, Saul Berlin dies in London and he's buried in the cemetery there. Here you see, he has a Hebrew tombstone and also an English tombstone. I'll read you what the Hebrew tombstone says in a second. I have to say, when I was in London, he's buried in uh, East End in the old... Uh, the old cemetery was his first, the Sardim used that cemetery. They told me they would open it specially for me. And I didn't take pictures because I remember seeing images online. And now I can't remember if the Hebrew text of the tombstone that I'm going to read you still exists. I have a text here from a, a safer from the early 20th century. And I think he might be copying it from earlier. Everywhere I look online, all I get is this, um, this image um, that this, uh, the tombstone of Rabbi Saul Berlin. So uh, son of Hart Lyon, chief rabbi, or C. Levin, who was also rabbi in London. And so I don't know whether the Hebrew text, I mean, it's not so simple to say, I go back to London and just go there because the cemetery is closed. You have to get special permission to have it open for you. Uh, so if anyone in London knows about this, if you can tell me, it, it, let me know. But uh, in here, he says something, strange that in London, they used to recite uh, at the great synagogue, uh, and then it was printed in the Adler, uh, the Rutledge Machsar, the different, uh, they, they would commemorate um, uh, the early rabbis uh, in on Yisker prayers uh, when they had uh, the Chagin. And one of the people who they mentioned was uh, none other than Saul Berlin. And uh, he just says, uh, he just mentions that, and he says, you cannot defend the inclusion of his name together with the august company of the rabbis of the great synagogue. I will tell you how his name got in there. This I have no doubt, uh, and, uh, and, and the answer is clear. He, he's, if he, he, is, he dies in 1794, uh, but his brother becomes chief rabbi of... Uh, of London United Synagogue Solomon Herschel, or Herschel, I think it's pronounced Herschel actually, in 1802. So there's no question that Solomon Herschel put up the tombs, put up the uh, Matseva. Uh, in fact, the Matseva says as follows. You can find this in the book Echa Beirav by uh, Moshe Menachem Walden. It mentions the original Matseva calls him uh, 
Moreno Rav Shalz at Saul, Ben Moreno Rabbeinu, etc. Tzvi Hirsch, Av based in Berlin. And then it says the brother of Shlomo, Moreno Shlomo, Av based in the Kilosenu. So he's saying it's the, so he dies in London. He's buried. I don't know what type of tombstone he had. His brother becomes rabbi in London. His brother puts up a tombstone for him, a nice Mechubadik honorable tombstone, and then it must be his brother stuck his name in among the, the people they remember at the Yort sites. There's a root, so, he, so he's buried together with all the big, uh, you know, and his, he's buried next to some big rabbis, uh, Zarek Hotev Shif is there. Uh, there is a rumor that uh, he committed suicide. I can't say whether that's true. I, it's, it, it's, a, it's an oral tradition that um, is mentioned, but uh, if you look in Nelson Svi Friedman's uh, Otsar Harabanim, he records it. And then um, when he was challenged by this, he said it's a tradition. So who knows? Uh, and that is it with Shaul Berlin. Any questions? I'll get back to that uh, later. I just see someone asks that uh, the Messiah Rosh had proto reform ideas. Did he have any significant influence? No, he had no significant influence. He, he had some of his true vote had influence but not the radical ones I mentioned, not the crazy ones. Uh, some of the other Chuvot are mentioned and they had some influence. Uh, he had no communal influence or anything like that. And, uh, and uh, the, the Chuvot we've read have all been regarded as outliers. Even people who generally accept the Psalming Rosh see those Chuvot as problematic. And uh, uh, you can look in the book I have, the Psalming Rosh in the back, he, he mentions some people who refer to them, but no one, no one adopts uh, halacha, this, this halacha argument that there's no idea of martyrdom anymore uh, that totally overturns uh, 2,000 years of, uh, of, of halacha. No one ever said such a thing, and no one ever said the other things uh, we mentioned. Okay, so let us move on. We are now at the end. Of, so Saul Berlin, he, he tried his best, and he failed, but uh, others will succeed. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, you have, uh, sorry, into the 18th century, you have proponents of Jewish educational reform, not yet religious reform. That's going to come soon. And they, but they were interested in more than just expanding the curriculum to make room for secular studies, of which there was. They wanted the Jewish tradition to be conveyed in a way different than what had been done. How it had been conveyed? By Cheder. And they're the old way of doing things. They wanted Judaism to be a modern religion. So what makes it modern? So, uh, well, so for instance, a catechism. Every good Christian knows you have a catechism uh, summarizing in good form what you have to believe. So, uh, and, and this allows you to distinguish the essence of the faith from those things that are unimportant. So uh, these uh, educational reformers at the end of the 18th century begin putting out catechisms. And you have a number of these catechisms in the late 18th century, uh, often modeled on Maimonides' 13 principles, even if they don't follow exactly what he says, but uh, that sort of model. And the belief is, the focus is always on belief, not halacha. The maskilim, and that's what they were, we're not dealing with reformers yet, we're dealing with maskilim, but the maskilim very soon merge into reformers. They begin to see the synagogue in a new light. The synagogue is not just a place where you go to fulfill your obligations to, to Davin. They're looking at what's going on in the churches, especially the Protestant churches, and they're saying, well, the synagogue should now be a place where prayer could affect the spirit of the worshiper, where you leave synagogue a different person. Prayer is a subjective experience that leaves you a different person. Now, it's true that you can find, uh, you can find, Jews today that speak about this, people uh, influenced by Hasidut, neo Hasidut, and uh, there's nothing wrong with it. But that's uh, that's not how Jews spoke in, in in the 18th century. Jews spoke about we got a daven, and uh, that's that's what it is. Uh, it's uh, in fact, if you go to the Sephardic community, they don't say you don't say what time is davening. You don't say we got to go daven now. They use the word prayer. We have to go pray. And if you're an Ashkenazi, it always sounds strange because like we don't pray. That's what Christians do. We daven. Um, it's, but prayer was, and this might be one of the examples of where the, the Maskilim and then the earlier reformers were onto something that traditional Jews were lacking. Rav Shamshan Rafael Hirsch is honest enough to acknowledge that there are things 
that traditional Judaism is lacking, and it's Dafka, the reformers, that are going to call attention to some of the lacuna, not because they invented it, but because this is part of traditional Judaism. But in all these years in the ghetto, we overlooked it, we forgot about it, and uh, and therefore, if we then start adopting certain of these things, it's not because the reformers, it's only because though they've reminded us of what we forgot, just like non-Jews can remind us of our obligations. But the, the, the Maskilim said that prayer needs to be a spiritual experience. Um, problem with this is, uh, you know, spiritual experience. Once a week, maybe it can be a spiritual experience. If you're going three times a day, it's hard for it to be a spiritual experience. That's just life. Uh, Rav uh, Isha Zalman Meltzer said about Rav Cook that uh, his mincha on a weekday is uh, more spiritual than our ni'ila. But I mean, now that's Rav Cook. Uh, so it was this type of thought that was very popular in the late 18th century. If Judaism were to be a religion like other religions, then the synagogue would have to be for Jews, like the church was for the Christians, namely the focus of religious life. But we know that synagogue attendance is declining in the 18th, 18th century. Many Jews were not Shomer Shabbos, they were Jews, but they used the Shabbos for secular pursuits. Others, we know, visited the churches, and they found the churches inspiring. First of all, you have instrumental music. Oh, that's that's got to be inspiring, instrumental music. Um, they had a sermon. There were no sermons in the 18th century in Ashkenazic shuls. Here you have a sermon which serves to uplift the people, to speak to them about uh, values and spirituality. And uh, um, there's a cantor who's uh, you, you, together with the muse, not the traditional cantor, but using the music and a choir. You see all these things. They didn't call it a cantor, the person doing the hymns, whatever they did in the church. Uh, so this influence them, and you start having these people writing in the late, 19th, the late 18th century that we have to remake the synagogue so it speaks to us. I just, I want to stress this again. There were no sermons. There, the, the genre of a sermon does not exist in the 18th century. You have uh, drushas, but a drusha is not a sermon. The sermon leaves you, is supposed to uplift you, it's supposed to touch your soul and make you a better person and uh, connect you with spiritual things. Uh, as I said, to the, many times I said, we take it for granted today because our synagogues all have them Shabbos morning. But this comes, if we get to the Shem Shem for Hirsch, we'll see he's one of the first to say that this is something we can use and there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, but uh, so they see all this. Also, the, they write about how they're impressed with the decorum. You go into a shtibel, there's lots of noise going on. Kids are running up and down. Now we could say correctly, well, the kids feel at home there. That's why they act like this. It's uh, it's like when they go to the grandparents so the and they can run around and be excited versus the, the they go to them when the, the, the relative where they can't go in a certain room and there's the plastic on the couches and all that. Uh, you know which one they prefer. So um the churches, uh, even to this day, I speak. I work at a Catholic university. I speak to the students. They, I mean, uh, the synagogue is much more homey. The uh, the show, the church they visit once a week, if that, and uh, so everything you know, you you treat it like you're a guest. But uh, the, the show was like a home. But on and and visitors who visited the synagogue describe non-Jews how uh, how how could this be a place of worship of God? Because we all know a show is not just worship; it's it's everything we learn there, and uh, we see our friends there. It's it's uh, before Mordechai Kaplan came around; it was the center. It was it was our Jewish center. Uh, but these maskilim, they're once a week Jews, if that. Uh, that's that's pretty. They usually don't even go at all once a week. But they want this. They want it to be dignified. And they're looking at the church, and they're seeing the. Uh, and and then it's true. The maskilim had a point when they say that in the show, that business matters and gossip was going on. Uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, if you go to any one of our shows, you'll see the same thing. But you know, it, it, we have a longer service. We have Torah reading and we have uh, aliyahs and sometimes Misha Beras that go on. So people talk. That's just that this isn't something new. This has been going on uh, for from time immemorial. But if you go to a short service and it's like a church sort of service, you, you don't do that. It's just a different, a different approach. But they wanted, they didn't see the show as dignified. So the language was a problem. 
the um, in the Protestant Church, it would be in German. The Catholic Church, you couldn't make this argument. What I'm going to what they're going to make because it's in Latin, but the people didn't speak Hebrew anymore. If they could read it, they couldn't understand what they were reading. You go into the Lutheran Church, there, um, you, you understand what you're saying. So. By the late 18th century, we find the liturgy being translated into modern German. The service is still in Hebrew, but it's being translated into German. Now, we previously had, had translations into Yiddish, Judeo-German, mostly for the women, uh, um, but then even for the men, it became useful because the younger generation was more at home in German, and not just in German, in German and German characters. So the, these... Um, educational, now synagogue reformers, before there's a reform movement, are saying we need to have parts of the liturgy, not all of it, but parts in German. We need to have a, a sermon in German. Uh, during the, this period, the, the Moscowian period, they started speaking about abolishing PUT. We've abolished a lot of PUT. Uh, I mean, go on Yon Tishabov. I've said this also many times. They pick out 10, 15 kinos and they'll say them, and I'll talk about them and the rest they don't say, but that's not the way it was in the traditional show. These uh, early proto-reformers were saying that the people are not paying attention. They're becoming bored. So let us get rid of some piyutim. Today, what shows, lots of shows have gotten rid of Yotzeros and piyutim and all sorts of things. But in those days, no, this is what you have to do. And if, uh, if you're bored, so you sit there and you sit there bored. Uh, what the Maskilim said is that these prayers are not understood by anyone and they don't add anything to the service. Already Ibn Ezra had criticized Khalir uh, for no one could understand what he was saying. Uh, and that's true. So there could be a value to saying things if you don't understand it. Uh, but uh, the Maskilim were saying no. If you think for a minute though, if you take our Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur services, davening, if you got rid of all the piyutim and got rid of all the, uh, the medieval stuff, it wouldn't take very long. The Rambam had a very short uh, high holiday service. So in the last years of the 18th century, you begin to see attempts at reforming, real reform, various parts of the synagogue service, not only in Germany, but also in France. I would say many of these are reforms with a small r, as opposed to reforms with big r. After all, if you take out a piyut here and there, if you take out Yukum Porkan, I don't think anyone's going to say if you take out Yikum Purkan, that's a reform with a capital R. We will see soon reforms with a capital R. That is unluckily problematic and absolutely forbidden uh, reforms. But right now, we're still talking about reforms that uh, could be justified and in certain places would be adopted. Uh, we'll, we'll see later on, because I, I, I think I have to carry this through all the way we'll do with Shamsha Hirsch. He gets rid of Kol Nidre. In, when he was rabbi of Oldenburg, then he puts it back in. Uh, and we have other examples as well. Uh, now, these attempts at the end of the 18th century to, to get rid of uh, certain prayers didn't have much influence. So I want to skip them and focus on how reform bursts on the scene in the early 19th century, because it's that which creates the great dispute, the major international battle that breaks out about reform is reform ever permissible? What is permissible? And uh, and then we're going to see the fascinating point that reform could be permissible, but only if the rabbis are doing it. If these people are doing it, and we know that they're not good Jews, then uh, by definition, uh, we can't uh, agree with it. Uh, and from the early 19th century, the battle lines are drawn. It's from then that we can date the origin of orthodox polemics, even of orthodoxy. The whole idea of orthodoxy exists in opposition to reform. You can only speak about the concept of orthodoxy when there's reform. Before that, it's just traditional Judaism. And yet a traditional shul that everyone went to, some are more observant, some are less observant. Think the Sephardic world. But once you have an actual movement advocating reform and you have a counter movement that's advocating uh, upholding the tradition. And not only is it advocating upholding the tradition, we'll see that's advocating even more than simply upholding the tradition, because in response to the new reform, you have to do more, then you can speak on orthodoxy. Uh, and then we, so then that's when reform uh, begins. Reform with a capital R that continues to this day, although many, many changes. Okay. So let's go back to Berlin. Early 19th century, approximately 3,500 Jews living in Berlin. I, I hope to go to Berlin uh, this summer. I have a lot to do this summer because uh, my Stolperstein, 
for Rabbi Weinberg. I still haven't seen it yet. We were supposed to have a huge thing with the rabbinical seminary there in 2020 in June and it had to be canceled because of COVID. So I don't know if we're going to do a big uh, thing, but I, I definitely want to go see it. And every time I walk in Berlin, um, I, I relive these disputes. You can go there now. You can see Mendelssohn's grave. One day we'll do a trip again. It, the whole cemetery was destroyed, not by the Nazis. Again, they, they left cemeteries for this odd reason by the communists. But we do have, at least we have a, a Matseva. It doesn't mean he's buried right there. Um, well, in the first two decades of the 19th century, you have approximately 3,500 Jews living in Berlin. And there is one main show. Private services, you couldn't have private minyan. Private minyan were prohibited. And that was the standard and standard way that Jews have lived throughout the generations. On the other hand, we do know that there is a number of, um, there were approximately a dozen minyanim that were illegal, but no one was enforcing it, so no one cared. So, uh, uh, but technically they weren't allowed to, it's not like in Altona, where uh, Ravaka Vemden was given permission to have a private minyan, and he was very proud of that. Uh, no, these were... Uh, uh, minyanim, not official minyanim. Um, we know that because of the secularization, uh, the, the, the turn away from religion, the main shul, the big shul, was usually empty. Very few people went to it. Uh, now, Mendelssohn had always advocated keeping uh, the traditional practice with cultural integration. But now, <laughs> generation or two later, people want cultural integration. What they don't want is uh, the tradition. And instead, their, 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 their sentiments are not of sentiments of connecting to halacha or of Torah, but rather they're connecting to Germany, which now they can be part of Germany. They're allowed to move out of the ghetto and be part of it, of modern Europe. In the early 1800s, we see the first reform services, and we can use those terms. And the very two first ones, one is founded by this man, Israel Jacobson, who was a businessman, uh, but uh, because of his activities for reform, he's, uh, as it says, considered one of the heralds of uh, reform Judaism. Uh, there's another individual we'll talk about, David Friedlander. Um, we'll uh, see more about him in a little bit. Um, you can see their dates. Uh, so getting back to Jacobson, in the town of Zisen, S-E-E-S-E-N, Westphalia, Jacobson builds a synagogue there, which he calls a temple. This is the first example of a synagogue called the temple. Now, we don't have any contemporaneous evidence that says that the reason he called it a temple was uh, to take the place of the temple in Jerusalem, but that seems to make the most sense, and we know that after this, lots of, uh, of synagogues began to be called temples, and uh, they did not believe in return to the Israel, so it makes sense that, uh, and later generations definitely saw temple as taking the place of the temple, because we have our local temple, we don't need that temple over there in Jerusalem, that was not going to be rebuilt anyway, uh, but we don't see that from the beginning. Uh, but I, why else would we call it temple? I'm assuming that has to be it. Uh, incidentally, uh, there were conservative synagogues also start calling themselves temples in America, but there are orthodox synagogues that call themselves temples also in the 20th century. And I have a list of a few orthodox temples. Why an, ortho, ortho, why an orthodox synagogue out west? You can look in that book I put online by uh, Harold Scharfman um, on the, my blog post, the last one, in which he has some great pictures. And he has pictures of the synagogue his father served in orthodox synagogues that called himself temple. I think what it is, if you're in wherever he was, Kansas or Iowa or something, you want the non-Jews to, non-Jews know uh, that, that this is the Jewish place, so you call it a temple. I think that's probably why. But you did have orthodox synagogue called temple. So his temple, his synagogue, he puts a bell tower on top, if you can believe that. <laughs> uh, obviously, the Christian element. And um, as far as I know, only one later German synagogue has a bell tower. In the inside of the synagogue in uh, Zissen, they, they move the bima from its traditional position, which is in the middle, and move it closer to the ark. This is a clear imitation of how churches look, where they have the altar up in the front. And you can see that if you come with me this summer, you'll see in the Dohani synagogue in Italy. We'll also go, God willing, to Italy this summer. You'll see where in the old Italian synagogues, they also move the bima to the front, uh, influenced by uh, uh, Christianity. Uh, 
They also put in the synagogue in Zisan, and you can see this as well in uh, the Dohani Synagogue in Budapest, uh, a raised pulpit to give sermons. Like uh, you've probably seen pictures and things where the, where the priest or the bishop goes up, he walks up on top and he looks down at the community. I've never, other than the, uh, the Dohani synagogue, I've never seen an Orthodox synagogue that has, I've never seen, I've never seen an Orthodox, it's not an Orthodox synagogue, in Dohani, I've never seen a synagogue that has it. In fact, in Dohani, those who have been with me probably recall, there's two, two raised pulpits because they had two rabbis there and the rabbis couldn't get along with each other. So, and one Shabbos, one rabbi would give the drasha, the other Shabbos, the other rabbi would give the drasha, and they built two separate uh, pulpits, uh, so each one would have their pulpit. And one of these rabbis, who couldn't get along with the other one, his name was Hevesi. He's the grandfather of Alan Hevesy, who uh, was city controller of New York, intermarried, then did time in the big house, unfortunately. But uh, his grandfather was the neolog, um, chief rabbi of, co-chief rabbi of, uh, of uh, Budapest. And when I say neolog, he's a Shomer Shabbos, kosher, the whole bit. We're not dealing with reformers here. They're like right-wing uh, conservative. Uh, in this, oh, so further in the synagogue in Zisim, there were Latin inscriptions adorning the building. In addition to the Hebrew ones, there's an organ in the synagogue. I'm assuming a non-Jew played the organ, although I don't know of any evidence. Later on, we'll see that become standard. And women sat in the balcony. So this is the first reform synagogue by Jacobson and Zisim. And women are sitting in the balcony. Women, I've said it before, let's see how many remember. What is the first synagogue in Jewish history, world history, that men and women sit together? Who's going to type it in? I'll keep talking and see who can type it in. And I'll give you a hint. Nah, the Rabbi Kelman, but he, 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 it's like when you have these kinds I apologize. Any, I apologize. I should have done that. I'm anyone sorry. who is associated with ABC uh, television cannot participate in the contest. So, but yes, absolutely correct. It's in Albany, Isaac Mayer Wise. Until World War I, even in Germany, men and women sat together. Uh, the earlier, the church, in the churches, they, they, they until World War I, men and women sat separately. And that's how the churches were. Um, only in Weimar, that is after World War I, the Weimar period, where was mixed seating introduced into uh, uh, synagogues in Germany. Uh, now, they did remove the machitza in Germany before Weimar. And in some cases, the women came down from the balcony, but they didn't sit with men. They sat separately on the same level. And as Rabbi, well, I, well you said Albany, but who introduced it? Isaac Mayer Wise. Um, and um, oh, yeah, there, there, there's a lot, it was a controversial, and uh, there's a lot written on this. Uh, and churches, as I said, also didn't have mixed views. Now, the, the Bema, the placement of the Bema, doesn't become such a huge issue in Germany. It's not it, it, as it does in Hungary. I mean, in Germany, they also recognize it's inappropriate, but Hungary, this becomes such a central thing. When we get to how Hungary deals with reform, the Gedolim, or many of the Gedolim, because not all of them signed on, said that you can't even step foot into a synagogue if the beam was not in the middle. And we'll see what Ramosha Feinstein uh, has to say about that. Now, we have an eyewitness report of the opening of the temple in Zisen in 1810. And you can find this eyewitness report. Gunter Plaut has two volumes of prime texts, uh, primary texts of the reform movement. One focuses on America, the other focuses on Europe. And if you look in there, you can, uh, and I printed it out, it talks about how, first of all, in the dedication of the temple, the, the eyewitness reports that Christians who were in attendance, nothing wrong with that, but they join in the singing. And it ends on a universalistic theme. Here it is. The festivities were original and unique. Where would one have seen a similar day on which Jews and Christians celebrated together in a common service in the presence of more than 40 clergymen of both religions and then sat down to eat and rejoice together in intimate company? I'm assuming they, they, what they were eating wasn't God kosher. Jacobson says as follows, it's not been my intent to bring about a complete religious unification of all religions. He says that we, I don't want a, a unification of the religions. And in Plaut's introduction, he cites this as proof that, uh, that Jacobson was not interested in religious assimilation. He was interested in reform, but not religious assimilation. But if you look at his next words, that is Jacobson's next words, after saying that it's not my intent to bring about a complete religious unification of our religions, he says as follows, 
One accomplishes nothing at all if one desires everything or too much at one time. What is needed is gradual and slow development. So I, I, at least I'm reading it, it seems to be saying that religious unification is, is not ipso facto wrong, but in today's day and age, it's not something we can do. But in the future, this could be a goal. I guess when the Christians get rid of their belief in Jesus, you know, then we can all be worshiping the divine together. What I will pick up with next class, I see it's already just about 930, is Jacobson is going to tell us what he what's driving him. And then we're going to get into a very interesting tangent, because uh, Jacobson is going to make the argument that it's vital that our religious service not be disgraceful, not for us only, but in the eyes of our neighbors. And I think most people today, if you told them this, they'd say so the idea that we're going to determine what our shul service looks like based upon what the Vayim think, that's... Uh, that's not a normal way of looking at it. That's that's a classical reform way of looking at it. And you will see, I'm going to cite you Rishonim and Acharonim, who believe it or not, say the exact same thing, that our synagogue service has to be, a, cannot be a Chil Hashem. The very concept that a synagogue service could be a Chil Hashem in the eyes of the volume. And then we'll move on to... Uh, uh, well, Friedlander and... Uh, well, lots of good stuff uh, coming up. But let me take the, let me make a note here. Let me take the questions, lots of questions. Um, someone asked privately, last week I spoke about it, maybe permitted for a Kohen to go to the funeral of a non-Jew. Sometimes the person could have been Jewish, but may not have been aware of it, someone says. Yeah, it's possible, uh, but uh, generally we don't make that assumption. Uh, the Gemara already said, deals with that. Someone could be descended from this, the 12 tribes, the 10 tribes. And you could always have a suffix, but uh, unless you know otherwise, if you know that someone's a Christian, that you know, uh, you can assume that. Uh, after all, we, we, we do much more important things than going to funerals. I mean, we use non-Jews as a Shabbos guy. And, uh, um, and there have been some cases. There was a case in, uh, in Israel, supposedly, where the Shabbos guy, turns out he was a Russian, turns out he was actually Jewish. Uh, they thought he wasn't Jewish, but uh, they, they have crazy cases like that. But generally, we have a concept of a Shabbos guy, and we don't worry that maybe uh, four generations ago, uh, his, his maternal grandmother was Jewish. Naftali tells us Rabbi Oretz also taught at YUJSS. Uh, he indeed, he did. He's actually the translator of, the, you, some of you probably know that uh, that red volume of Tanakh, Judaica Press, which is uh, a translation of all the Rashis on Tanakh and a selection of commentaries. Uh, the very first one that came out uh, in the 70s, I guess it is, uh, on Yosef Yoshua, that was done by Rabbi uh, Oretz. Um, and Ruth says, or it's taught at Esther Schoenfeld. Well, I have to, back in the day, I have to say that I don't even know what Esther Schoenfeld is. I guess it's a school, but I never heard of it. Uh, so someone privately points out in the Torah, Sota is spelled with a sin. You seem to apply there was a Samach. Well, it, and then you say by the time of Chazal, no difference in pronunciation, all got written as Samach. The, uh, the Chazal writes it as a Samach. The Ramam still writes it as a sin. You know, the word Sata, Sin Tet, hey. Uh, why there was a change, uh, I always thought because they sounded the same, so it didn't really matter, but I, I don't know why uh, they weren't mocked on it. Someone sprints us, says that Islam was not considered idolatry of monotheistic Christianity because of the Trinity is considered, it's questionable as a monotheistic religion. Yes, so that, so you say, that may be a difference in why the Moranos were okay to convert and be secret Jews. No, I don't understand because the Moranos were converting to Christianity, not to Islam. That's, uh, they, it's the same thing that the Moranos were speaking about, or conversos, uh, they were, uh, were dealing with uh, Christianity, both in, in, in France and Germany, as well as in Spain and Portugal. It is the case that there was an earlier, in Spain, an earlier forced conversions in the Rambam's day of the Almohads, but uh, that's, uh, yeah, yeah that's what I was saying actually is that Many of the Muslims didn't consider it, uh, many of the Jews didn't consider it, it the same as in conversion the same because they're converting to to um, Christianity, a monotheistic religion. Yes, like absolutely. Considered. Absolutely. That's absolutely the case. But the thing is, we're speaking about um, in the, the end of the 14th century and the 15th century, where you have mass conversions of Jews to Christianity in Spain. 
Uh, and then with the expulsion, you have, uh, I mean, the numbers are unbelievable. In fact, it seems that more Jews, or at least this is the claim, by uh, Norman Roth, and uh, even people don't uh, just don't agree with him, know it's massive numbers. Norman Roth thinks that the majority of Jews converted to Spain, converted to Christianity in Spain from 1391 on. And now, there we're dealing with Christianity. So the question remains, why, when it came to Christianity in Spain and Portugal, do we not have the martyrdom that we have oh, okay. in the Christian in the Christian in the Christian lands of Germany and England and France? So that will have to hold off to uh, our nice bus trips where we go into great detail and we deal with the great disputes between the two Roths, Norman Roth and Cecil Roth. And Norman Roth's allies include Ben Sion Netanyahu and uh, others. And Cecil Roth's allies, we 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 have fun. Michael says the Messiah. Oh, no, we got to that. Susanna says, "Well, Aramaic found its way into the center because that's what people understood." I'm not sure what uh, the. Re well, you were talking from. about yeah. about uh, the vernacular. So there was a time when Aramaic was the vernacular, and yeah. you got. Oh. Yeah, and uh, we have we have vernacular for the women in particular. Aramaic, though, is not just for the women. We have it to this day in the center, Brichme and all, uh, other things that are are Aramaic. Um, uh, in theory, we'll see there's nothing wrong with vernacular. It's Chazal tell us there's nothing wrong with it. The problem that the Gedolim had is how to say that it's wrong when the Gemara, when Chazal tell us that it's permissible. Uh, that, that's going to be one of the, the most difficult things that the Gedolim have to do, because when the reformers are going to say that we want to pray in the vernacular and the rabbis are going to say you can't, how can you say you can't when the Rambam is explicit to feel the Cholachon and the, the Gemara, etc.? Uh, Ellie says that er, my kids live in Berlin, in Kira for Louder, started a new community based on old and wonderful place and growing. I, I don't know if that's related. I think you're, that's related to what you're referring to is the, the Rabiner seminar, the Adas Israel there in, um, in Berlin. We, on our trip there, we ate there and I've been there uh, a few different times. And that is the, the, the community. There is a Chabad community, Rabbi Teichtal, but the non-Chabad, the it's a community. We were there. We saw the, the nursery. Uh, there's lots of little kids, little kids playing, speaking German. But this is the Shomer Shabbos community of young people and, you know, working people. And there's people, not just yeshivish people, but regular people. And it's a very, very nice uh, community. And yes, you can uh, please make the connection to your son-in-law. I'd love to because... Uh, when I go to back to Germany, I'll be uh, traveling around again. Um, and uh, he's ra official rabbi of a German state. I assume he's a Musbach of the Rabbiner Seminar. When we go on our Germany trip, we also uh, eat with one of the rabbis who who come from there. Yes, he um, is. He's, he's, he's a, he was a second graduating class. Ah, so very good. Um, so, so rabbi should now says the term orthodoxy came from reform, used for them as a characterization against traditional, as a matter of respect, the term. That's what Hirsch says, that it was a uh, negative term, use the term. We'll get to that. Uh, but it's been accepted. It's not the only such term. Uh, I've said it already in the past. The term misnagdim was a term of used by the Hasidim, and yet the Hasidim were uh, used against the non-Hasidim, but it was the Hasidim who were more than misnagdim. But we have that in... in um, um, we have lots of examples of that where people pick terms. The term queer used to be a negative term. And then you take a term and you can uh, you can uh, use it and that gets rid of the negativity. Uh, M.H. Lazerson, am I saying that the concept of kavon and ruach may have links to masculine? No, I'm not saying the concept of kavana and ruach. I'm saying the idea that you are a spiritually uplifted person the way we think of it uh, and that you're religiously inspired uh, Look, I guess it is the same as Kavana, but that's not what they meant. Uh, it's uh, They meant that you come out religiously inspired. Uh, so in theory, we're supposed to. You're right. I would say this is one of the examples where uh, um, where they were onto something here, that in, we are. But uh, we all know that uh, if it happens a few times a year uh, or on Rosh Hashanah, it's not something when it's routin. See, that's the whole issue of tefillah as routinization. Hasidus had to deal with this. If tefillah is something that you do constantly, because by rules, originally it didn't have to be rules, but then they made it routine that you have to do it because people couldn't pray on their own. 
Rambam tells us. But then whenever you have a routine, what suffers is uh, the spontaneity and the spirituality. So it's always a struggle. What the Maskilim were saying is that we do not have this anymore. And therefore, let's try to bring it back. And how do you bring it back? Well, you bring it back with a choir. You bring it back with an inspiring sermon. All these ways we're supposed to uh, bring it back. And yes, the Italians call their synagogue uh, temples. But when, since when do they start calling it temples? I believe that this is only a recent thing. The synagogue, for example, in Rome is called a temple. But I, this is uh, this is taken from the reformers. The, the, the Italian synagogues, if you walk into the Italian synagogues, you could feel like you're in a church. They were designed uh, just like a church. And those who listened to my interview with Rabbi Desaini will recall I asked him what he thinks about the, uh, the organs that they played. And he didn't mince any words. He says, ah, that came from the Christians. Um, Oh, and there you say the foreign synagogue is almost a replica of the Catholic Church. I uh, guess the Florentine synagogue has a raised pulpit. That's right. Thank you for reminding me. Not only does it have a raised pulpit, the rabbi uses the raised pulpit when he speaks. In the foreign synagogue, they move the bima to the middle. It used to not be in the middle. They moved it to the middle. But uh, the rabbi still goes up and speaks from the pulpit. Uh, the synagogue in Verona still has the bima in the front, as they all used to have in the front. Oh, and Rabbi Yellen says, Borough Park at Town of Bethel, or Orthodox Show. Yes, indeed. Uh, oh, but so Azerson tells us that the rabbis do not use the pulpit uh, most recently. Most of them do not use it because uh, of the long staircase. I can tell you that the last time we were in Italy, and that was, um, they have a new rabbi, or they had a new rabbi. Now he's gone, they have a different new rabbi. He used the pulpit. But the previous one, Rabbi Levy, who was there for many years, every time I heard him speak, he did not use the pulpit. Uh, I want to use it. It looks fun to go up there, but it always has a marker. I mean, a block, it has like a, a thing there, a, a, like a belt, so you can't get up. But if no one's there one day, I want to walk up. Uh, and Rabbi Shudnow says, ah, thank you. In Marseille, the rabbi spoke from above. Rivka says, when speaking Hungarian, religious Hungarian Jews are sure to show as the temple. Uh, which religious uh, Hungarian Jews? I've been with a lot of Hungarian Jews. I've never heard them refer to the synagogue as a temple. Yes, unless it is. These, unless these yes. are neologue Jews. No, uh, no, 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 no. It's called, that's the word for synagogue in Hungarian. Okay, when they're speaking Hungarian. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, I speak Hungarian. Ellie says the Jewish center in Manhattan doesn't have to be in the center. Um, I'm trying to think back, but um, yes, but the, but the, but it doesn't, but where the, it's not in the front. I mean, yes. it's sort of in the front, but it's not, oh, it's not in the, in the way, way front. That is, yes, uh, it is. when yes, they have, is. no, no, the way, way front would be up by the Dima. It's back. It's, uh, it's pushed no, back. No, I go there every week. I know the school. Yeah, you know, I went there also when I lived there. I'm talking, it's not on the Dima. It's, uh, well, I guess. Uh, it's right in front of the right in front of it. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think back now when I haven't been there in a number of years. Okay, I take your word for it. I thought that it was pushed back a little. Um, no. I mean, a lot of shoals have it right in front where they do Pesukah de Zimra, and then they have something in the middle. Uh, you okay. know, I haven't been to the Jewish Center in over 20 years. So uh, um, if you go to Venice, you also see it. You see there was there were Sephardic shoals that were like this, where um, the uh, you have... Uh, well, there they have it, you know, in the back. The beam was in the back and the arrow was in the front. But you also, we'll get to it when we deal with it. The, the Rav Yosef Kara, the Kesef Mishnah on the Rambam says explicitly, there's no such concept that you have to have the beam. You can have the beam wherever you want, wherever people hear best. But it becomes a matter of, of uh, importance in the Ashkenazic world, precisely because the reformers were imitating the churches to do it that way. Exactly. And therefore it becomes exactly. important. So Ramosha Feinstein will say, We'll get back to this, but Ramosha will say that in America, it's not an issue. You don't need to be concerned about church shows like the Jewish Center because uh, it doesn't apply anymore because uh, we, we don't, we're not fighting the reformers uh, who are making it that the central thing. And it, the, the reason that these synagogues have it has nothing to do with the, the churches. So Ramosha says it's not an issue anymore. But the Hungarians think it's a big issue to this day. Uh, because of the Hassan Salfa. Yes, exactly. We'll get to it all. Gershon says, was the raised pulpit opposing the paradoxical concept of the Orebi Teva? Uh, I have heard that concept. No, no. It's, it's just that uh, that's what the churches used to do. Uh, and uh, Tali says, the base Knesset in Würzburg do not have Beeman Center. Yeah, and that's a big issue. Uh, when we get to the, the classes on Rabbi, Rabbi Bamberger, 
uh, he, 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 he could not fix that. That's one thing he wanted to fix. So we'll deal with that. And Rabbi Kelman says in the early 20th century, a reformed temple in Germany was offered about a million dollars on the condition they had mixed seating and they turned it down. Uh, the Rosh says the base of Migash only had separation of the base of Shueva. Didn't early synagogues, iPad says, during the late second temple times have mixed seating? It seems so, although it's not clear exactly what they did in these synagogues. Uh, were these places, you know, davening wasn't, they did have davening, in, but, the, you know, davening wasn't the same. Uh, you had the base of Migdash where you had sacrifices, uh, could be mostly where they learned there. I don't know. It does seem the archaeologists do think that uh, Sperber has something on this also, that they did have mixed seating, but uh, subsequent to that, the halacha is you don't. Uh, and someone points out that the savannah of the synagogue looks like a church. In the 19th century in Warsaw, Dasa says a synagogue called the German synagogue. Yeah, the that would have been the... Um, the, the more modern synagogue, just like you have a choral synagogue. But remember, these synagogues did not have mixed seating. What made them more reformist is, and we're going to learn about one of these reform rabbis who's assassinated. He's a reform rabbi in one of these sort of synagogues in Poland. It's that they, um, it's that they had a choir. It's that they had a sermon and vernacular. There was never mixed seating in any of these shoals. Um, quickly, let me just get the last couple of things. Um, Ruth says that the West End Shul in Frankfurt today is Orthodox, but uh, the pre-war congregation was Reform. The organ is still up in the balcony where the women sat, uh, uh, and there's a very large section in front with a table that isn't used. The rabbi sits near the table. Uh, you, you, you find similar things. You see it in Venice. You see it in Rome. If you go in Rome, the organ is behind the uh, is behind the um, uh, the Aron Kodesh. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, just quickly. Uh, finally, Esther Schoenfeld was on the Holy side. I didn't know that. Uh, okay, there's lots of more comments. I think we'll end it here. I'll end. Um, oh, if uh, Esther says, Ellie says, my Oberlander family will not enter a show where the Bima is not in the middle. Um, that is true. You, you can, uh, Rabbi Professor Lyman, he has tapes of him going on a trip to Budapest and he's explaining all the. Uh, about the Dohani synagogue, and he says, real Hungarians won't enter it. So uh, if any of you are Oberlanders, you can stay out here while we go inside. Uh, the last thing, uh, someone privately says, regarding Kohenim going to funerals of non-Jews, a Kohen shouldn't come into contact with a dead animal's corpse. By saying that a Kohen can attend a Gentile's funeral, it implies that non-Jews are not really human beings, et cetera. I'd like to know where it says that Kohenim uh, can't come into contact with a dead animal's corpse. We dealt with that uh, last uh, semester uh, about uh, totally calling in a sheritz. But again, this isn't coming into contact with, uh, uh, you, you, can't, you can't go in the base of to today. I'm talking about today, not in temple times or anything. Uh, uh, but you can't go in the base of Migdash. I mean, you can't, we're not talking about touching anyway. We're talking about being in the same room. A Kohen cannot uh, touch a non-Jew. That's not the issue. The issue is being in the same room. Today, we don't have Tuma uh, with a Kohen anyway. So, uh, it's, but we, uh, for the base of Migdash, but. Uh, okay, there, there's a lot here. I can't answer all the comments or questions now because it's taking us pretty long, but Rabbi Kelman. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Mark will be back Wednesday interviewing Chaim Ishkashish from uh, Greece, he's uh, quite a character also. He's the one who leads our tours in Greece, uh, our local on the on the ground in Greece. So that will be this Wednesday at 2 p.m. Uh, before that, tomorrow we have a triple header. Um, Aaron Kohler will kick us off at 9.30 in the morning with uh, part three in a series on Miguel Let Us There. Uh, Rachel Sharansky Danziger at 11 a.m. on the ins and outs of liberty going through, through Sefer Shmot. And um, at 1 p.m., Alex Israel continuing his series on Eliyahu Prophet Affairs. So there's three classes tomorrow. And then, like I say, um, Wednesday, the communities around the world will be in, in Greece. So it uh, uh, should be a fascinating interview. And uh, we look forward to learning you. And please invite your friends uh, the rest of the week, all our regular classes. And uh, thank you, everybody. Laila Tov. And uh, everybody be well. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. All the best. Okay. Hope all is well in California.
Thank God. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. 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 Okay. And yes, Hungary. Uh, listen, Rav David Lifshitz, and why you wouldn't? I, from what I understand, wouldn't be Masada Kedushin inside a shul. I, I, I don't know. Be the empty. That was another thing of the Hungarians, right? You couldn't make a wedding in a shul. Couldn't have a round shul. All kinds of the rules they made in uh, 1869. But yes, yes. The Hungarians were a little crazy. They still are. They had a, an extreme uh, view. Listen, that's. Uh, the battles with reform, and uh, yes, undoubtedly, they were quite the uh, you know, yeah, they were the most extreme in their response. Uh -huh. uh -huh. But, um, no, no, anyways, but uh, that's uh, that's the way it could be, yeah. So, but, but you go to the shoes, the, the rules they had, I mean. Listen, our shuls would be considered reform. Any any shul that has a sermon there by the rabbi would be considered by Hungarians forbidden to walk into, uh, for sure. Would be no different than any than than, than Temple Emanuel in their eyes. But um, anyways, okay, everybody, Lila Tov, everybody, be well. Nice to see. You. We look forward to seeing you soon again.